Hi guys, it is a hot, sunny spring day here in early December 2019 here in the collapse of global industrial civilization right here in beautiful Austin, Texas today. And I am Sam Mitchell at Collapse Chronicles and today I have the great pleasure of bringing on this show, a fellow named Dr. Stephen Pine, who you might have heard me read an essay recently from Stephen about what he terms the pyrocene, the age of fire that we might be moving into here in the 21st century, and we're going to talk a lot about that later on in this interview, but just to give you a little background, Dr. Stephen J. Pine is an emeritus professor at Arizona State University, now retired, specializing in environmental history, the history of exploration, and especially the history of fire. Pine received his bachelor's degree at Stanford University and later attained his master's and Ph. degrees right here in Austin, Texas at the University of Texas. He spent 15 seasons as a wildland firefighter at the north rim of the Grand Canyon National Park between 1967 and 1981. Since the publication of his second book titled Fire in America in 1982, Pine has been known as one of the world's foremost experts on the history and management of fire. His book, Fire, A Brief History, has just been published in a revised second edition, including a new chapter, which we're going to focus on, The Pyrocene, A Brief Future. And with no further ado, do Stephen Pine, come on and say hello to the folks, and we're going to dive right into this. Well, hi, Sam, and hi to the rest of you listening. Okay, well, I, again, uh, as I told Steve, we have so much to talk about here, and I really, obviously, we want to uh, get into the pyro scene, a brief future, uh, in a little while, but of course, before we get to the future, we need to talk about the past. But before we even do that, uh, Stephen, just give us a few minutes of, uh, of your own personal background, how you personally took your, your interest in fire and turned it into becoming one of the world's experts on the history of fire and fire management. Well, it's a great question. Uh... <laughs> And it was an accident. Uh, it's one of those one of those serendipitous things that happens and then can can change your life. I was 18 years old, a few days after high school, and had signed on uh, as a laborer at Grand Canyon National Park. And they happened to have an opening um, on the North Ram Fire Crew. A guy called in, said he couldn't make it. They were anxious to fill it. There I was signing papers. They asked, "Do you want to go over to the north side and uh, be on a fire crew?" And what did I know? I said, sure. I uh, never had any experience. I didn't know the names of the tools. I didn't know the place. Uh, you know, but when you're 18, uh, you know, you can do anything. So uh, I said yes. And it was it was really a moment of, of biographical wind shear. I just suddenly somebody who had grown up in a Phoenix suburb. Sure, I'd played some sports. You know, I was valedictorian in high school. I really had no background for dealing with this. And suddenly I found myself on really a kind of blue collar world. Uh, really, you know, we did most of the outdoor stuff. We were, you know, we did a lot of chainsaw work when we weren't fighting fires. We were always clearing things, doing stuff. It was a totally different world. And it really became the challenge for me to reconcile these two. And it, it took a long time. I lived two separate lives for about 10 years and then finally realized I, I should try to put them together and take the training I, I'd been given as an academic and historian primarily and apply it to fire. So, and from there, the rest, as they say, is history. And I've been writing histories for 
the U.S., uh, Canada, Australia, Europe, including Russia, and world surveys. It's really taken me all around the globe. Okay. Well, we are, we are certainly glad it did, and we really <laughs> appreciate you coming and, and spending a few minutes of your busy schedule uh, with us on Collapse Chronicles talking about about your work and more importantly about the what you call the pact between humanity and fire. Now, of course, with a name like Collapse Chronicles, we're going to want to move into your vision of the pyro scene, which you're saying uh, could be the correct uh, term to define our near-term future. But before we get into the next 50 to 100 years, let, let's go back for the last 200,000 years. So, Stephen Pine, uh, take about 15 or 20 minutes to sum up humanity's pact with fire over the past 200,000 years and how we got to the point on this planet we have gotten to here in the waning days of 2019. Sure. Well, we'll have to go back earlier than 200,000 years. We'll have to go back over 2 million to the hominins that first sort of captured fire. But before that, we might want to go back about 400 million years and ask, why is there fire at all? I mean, the Earth is a unique fire planet. Uh, no other planet we know of uh, has it. So why does the Earth have it? Well, life in the oceans created oxygen. And then when life made it to the land, it provided fuels, and there was ample lightning around. So we have fossil charcoal that dates back 420 million years. I mean, it, it goes right to the beginning of when all these pieces came together. So fire is not some strange thing that um, just just appears or has appeared in recent times. It's, it's co-evolved with life. Uh, it's always been out there. In fact, it's unlike a lot of other disturbances that we often identify it with, say, hurricanes or tornadoes or floods, um, because all of, those, all of those are mechanical, they're physical. They could occur without a particle of life being present, but fire can't. Fire literally feeds on that living biomass or dead, once living biomass. And so there are all kinds of feedbacks possible. So... Plants have co-evolved with this presence. They have adapted. They can influence the kind of fire because if they change, fire changes. So you began, you know, lots of, of, of individual organisms and then communities began accommodating fire in curious ways, sometimes to protect themselves, put up uh, thick bark, uh, prune so that fire on the ground can't get up into the canopies all kinds of things like this. Uh, but there are also a whole range of adaptations that seem to rely on fire, expect it, need it, and even weirder seem to encourage it so that there are species that seem to increase their flammability over time. Why would you want to make yourself more flammable? Isn't fire a threat? Well, not necessarily. Not any more than, say, water is a threat. Uh, it, they've they've accommodated it, and so we see things. There are, uh, for example, shrub species in Southern California. Uh, some have been studied. Well, they, in, the older they age, you know, they put more dead wood um, in in accessible places. Uh, they change their flammability, their chemical component, so that it it reaches a maximum in the fall. Well, that's exactly the time the major winds, like the Santa Anas and Diablos, blow. So you see all these kinds of things that would you would think would be counterintuitive. You want to protect yourself from burning, but in fact, this may be an advantage. They can reseed or sprout faster than their competitors. This is sort of like nature practicing slash and burn agriculture. Uh, you can plant in the ash in ways that they couldn't. So it's really a very fascinating study. And for most of us who live in industrial world and uh, live in cities, you know, we're told learn not to burn. And we really don't want free burning flames running through our towns. Uh, my university students are prohibited from even having candles in their room. No kind of fire, no kind of flame will be allowed. 
Uh, but in nature, it's quite it's quite different. And many systems we've learned are actually disrupted by having fire removed. So we get a lot of attention recently in places like uh, Indonesia, the tropical peatlands, or um, Brazil, where a kind of industrial scale logging, land clearing, and then burning is going on, and fire is being introduced in ways that are completely out of proportion to to their evolutionary history, and these you know these these landscapes are being trashed. But in much of the industrial world, in much of the United States, if our public lands, nature reserves, the rest are actually suffering from a lack of fire. And it's not just that you're adapted to fire or not adapted to fire, it's it's the pattern of fire. You know, it's like saying something's adapted to rain. Well, it matters whether all the rain comes evenly month by month or whether it all comes in three months, same amount. And it's the same way with fire. And what we've seen is a disruption in the patterns or regimes of fire. So all this goes on, and then uh, a, a particular genus, the hominins, uh, acquire the ability to manipulate fire. What what do you understand? I have I have heard just wild guesses. When did humans first start learning how to start? and manage fire. A, mi a million, I've heard everything yeah. from 200,000 to a million years ago. Does anybody know when the first humans started using fire, or is this still a wild subject of speculation? Well, it, there's not a lot of evidence, you know, and unless, you know, people weren't building uh, uh, stone hearths at the time, uh, or, you know, or steel stoves. So uh, what is the record? You know, it, it, it just merges. You know, many Aboriginal peoples even today uh, sort of cook where they hunt. Yeah. And so uh, so they're always cooking, but, but they, they don't have, in the European sense, an established structure that archaeologists can easily find. But there's a lot of indirect evidence, and um, there are certainly hearths which do seem to be uh, human associated with tool making and other stuff that goes back 700,000 to a million years. This is the time we're talking Homo erectus, and it's hard to imagine erectus not having in all its existence. So we're talking about a couple million years, and there's evidence that some big change occurred where the, we went from sort of ape-like big guts and huge jaws to, to masticate um, vegetative, you know, heavy vegetative material and nuts and lots of other things, um, which required big guts to process and, and big jaws and, and small like skulls. The gorilla with, with model huge. you're talking about, kind of. So what we're talking about, what happened is that what shifted was cooking. Yeah. And suddenly you're processing this. Now, I mean, now we suffer from over-processing. So we've got, we've got all kinds of pathologies associated with too much. But at the time, this gave a real caloric boost. So there's a lot of evidence that suggests Homo erectus could cook. And in fact, it may be in our genome now, because uh, there's also evidence that we could not survive on a strictly raw food diet. So uh, this was already something that the hominins had. There were obviously a variety of, of creatures out there who could manipulate fire, but uh, eventually the sapiens, ourselves, uh, were the only one left standing, and we are essentially the only creature that can manipulate fire. Now, there there are some reports of um, kites and, and uh, uh, wedge-tailed eagles in northern Australia in the savannas that have been seen to pick up burning embers and, or, or sticks and drop them elsewhere because this is a kind of fire drive, and this they, they feed off that. Yeah. Um, and so that, that may very well be true, but it's not built in in the same way it is for people. So basically, we, we have a species monopolist, a species monopoly over this process. So very early on, even before we were Homo sapiens, the hominids had, had made a pact with fire. And I think it's one of the great questions of our time, whether this was a mutual assistance pact or whether it was a Faustian bargain. And we have certainly carried fire far beyond 
what would have been possible for fire under purely natural circumstances. But on the other hand, fire has so empowered us that we have been able to do things that would be unthinkable. I mean, we've taken fire to Antarctica and Greenland. We've, we've taken fire all over the planet. We've, we've taken fire off planet. Yeah, That's we've taken we fire to Mars and Jupiter on, on, on one level. So what is, so how much of the, the, the state of the planet, I'm talking about the bad mm -hmm. state of the planet, uh, <laughs> would you attribute as a fire historian to our, our, our pact with fire? Uh, how would this planet... B, what would it look like if humans had never discovered fire uh, compared to what it looks yeah. like because we did? Is that too much of a, a well? Oh, no, that's answer? that's yeah. That's give me some easy questions here. So <laughs> give me a few lobs. You got here. five minutes to answer that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, think about it. Almost all of Aboriginal economies, except for those that are based on you know oceans and fishing of some sort require fire. They require fire for agriculture. They require fire for hunting, for foraging, uh, require fire for cooking, uh, for warming, for illuminating. Uh, there are lots of stories about um, early peoples. Uh, you can still see in Aboriginal economies, basically, where their culture is something that's done over fire. That's what you do in the evening. You sit around, everybody becomes very mellow in the flames, and they they tell the stories. This is, you know, this is where the myths and the the accounts and the oral, the oral culture, uh, is told. So um, we've got that. We've got almost all agriculture that's outside of floodplains is based at some point on um, burning, and in that, to my mind, is also the reason for fallowing. So if you're going to have fire, you need fuel. And the way you get fuel in an agricultural system is to grow it. So you leave it alone for a, a year uh, and then burn it. And you may do this alternate years, three years, seven years, 11 year cycle. But at some point, you need to reintroduce fire because you need the ecological jolt, uh, the catalyst that, that fire provides. And you had all these strange stories of people finding more stuff to put on the fallowed field. They need a good fire. So they're hauling stuff in from the woods. They're drying out seaweed. They're bringing dung. They're bringing all kinds of stuff to get more. So start thinking about agriculture. Think about pastoralism uh, and how much of that is tied to moving uh, the flocks and herds around. And that is tied to a cycle of burning because you go up and down the mountains or you go across uh, places you burn in one season, then you take uh, the flocks elsewhere, then you come back and you've got fresh browse. I mean, there are a lot of experiments now you can see in tall grass prairie, places where they, they have free ranging bison, for example, um, and they do regular burning. Where do you find all the, the game animals? You find them on the freshly burned area. And so that's a way to begin manipulating the movement of these herds at, at a large scale. Uh, so you're not always just driving animals, but you're drawing them, you're attracting them by providing bait in the form of fresh forage. Uh, and then of course, we, we had this huge in, inflection when we decide that burning living landscapes isn't enough, we want more power. And so we look for new worlds to burn. And that we look to the geologic past to get that, or what I what I like to call lithic landscapes. And this is fossil biomass in the form of coal, oil, gas, and all the rest of it that were once living landscapes, now now lithified, and now we are exhuming those. We are burning them. It's essentially an unbounded source of fuel. We're burning those at the surface. This is interacting with all the living landscapes and all kinds of weird ways that have become terribly problematic. And then we're releasing all the effluent from that burning that's going into the geologic future. And we're going to be living with it for a long, long time. And that's why, so yeah, I, that's why I'm I particularly interested where that, where that intersection of these two happens, because that is what's really shaping fire in our world today. Yeah. You know, is it safe to say 
with without the invention of fire, I, I think it's safe to say that a there would probably be more forest on on the standing primeval uh, old growth forest on the planet. There would be more trees, and I'm guessing that there would be a lot less. D d sheer numbers of humans. Uh, how, what would the population of this planet be uh, w if we had never invented fire? Well, I, I think we would just be a minor savanna species. Uh, I mean, there's no reason to think otherwise, but even Erectus managed to travel very widely. And, um, and you think with, so, with the help of fire? Yeah. But but clearly fire. I, I mean, we 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 think of the industrial revolution about when the uh, about when the the population hockey stick really went into <laughs> into high gear with the when we started burning fossil fuels, and that's easy to understand. But as you're pointing out, that our entire agricultural system is uh, e e even before. Fossil fuels enter the picture. Is that we one hundred percent just yeah. feeding ourselves is dependent well, on fire? It, I I can't imagine us. I mean, um, going back, the steam engine and and fossil fuels is is a real uh, phase change. And the James Watt, the inventor of the modern steam engine, had a business partner Matthew Bolton, and Bolton famously remarked to visitors, I sell here, sir, what all the world wants, power. And our fire has always been a firepower, and that is how we have impressed ourselves on the world. And it's not just by randomly or burning in a kind of like vandals, uh, but fire has always been a catalyst. It's always been, it's very much an interactive technology, and all kinds of pyrotechnologies, if you want, were there. Now, what happens when we begin industrializing is that we begin shutting down, replacing many of those traditional pursuits. So you see a whole lot less agricultural burning when you industrialize. In much of the world, you think, wow, flames are everywhere. Actually, the amount of fire, open fire, is decreasing because we are yeah. finding alternatives for it. But when you take fire out of these systems, we're finding there's all kinds of ecological consequences. And one of them in many systems, and this is really true so, for so much of, of the U.S., is that nature continues to grow. And it changes itself in ways that eventually will burn. They won't be controlled burns. They'll be feral burns. And we now have wildfires and feral fires exploding much larger than they would have happened under natural conditions. So we have disrupted the whole pattern of fire that has grown up for millions in some cases, but certainly for hominids for thousands, in some, many cases, tens of thousands of years. We have upset that in ways that are making fire less controllable. Uh, less tame fire, more feral fire. So there's that story. It's just the whole thing has become scrambled. Yeah, but the big yeah, fire people, story. I, I think particularly in, in, in quote this community that I that I tend to run in, uh, we so much of the conversation is about we're setting uh, too many fires, and we forget the the other side of the coin. Uh, that way, that in places that need fire, you know, it's just like we can't do anything right. Can we do anything <laughs> right as well, humans with fire? Yeah, I here's here's how I here's <laughs> how I formulate it. We we have too much bad fire, we have too little good fire, and we've got way too much combustion. There you go. So that is uh, so that that's where we, so that's where we stand. So. But before we we start moving into the pyro scene, do, do you where do we stand uh, going into the famous twenty twenty? Where do we stand uh, with with our relationship uh, to fire heading into whatever's coming up the next thirty to uh, eighty years on this planet? 
how would you describe our place right now? Well, uh, I I think we have not done. We we are the keeper of the flame for the planet. We are the keystone species for fire, and uh, we have not done. Uh, we have not exercised our stewardship very <laughs> wisely, and that's even even for in our own self interests. And too many of the major economic and industrial powers are so removed from the daily experience of fire. We don't heat our homes. We don't light our our offices with it. We don't cook even with open fire. It's always electrical or some fossil fuel stuff. That it's so alien. We don't burn off our fields now. We we find substitutes. Most of them derive from fossil biomass of some kind. That it's very hard for us to appreciate fire. The only fire people in in sort of the more influential countries, if you will, or developed countries have is what they see on a screen or read about. And those are disastrous fires. They don't have a sense of, of this sort of deep relationship. And it is a relationship um, to fire. So there are plenty of bad fires out there, let's be clear. Uh, many of those are because we, we abdicated our responsibility to keep good fire on the landscape. So something's going to take it in. And so the weeds, the weedy fires, if you will, are, are taking over, the invasive fires. So that's, it's really not a, a pretty picture. In fact, it's pretty dismal. Uh, there are certain areas for, for 50 years now, the, the federal agencies in the U.S. have been trying to get good fire back in. Uh, some places are doing uh, pretty well. Uh, Florida is really a, an exemplar. It Florida burns about two and a half million acres a year under what they call prescribed fire. That is a controlled burning. Uh, they'd like to do more. Um, that has spread throughout much of the southeast, particularly in the coastal plain area, uh, the old traditional longleaf pine. It certainly spread into tall grass prairie. You can't keep tall grass prairie if you don't burn. It will be overrun with woody vegetation. And now we're finding that more and more places we're kind of savannas and we're trying to get fire back in. But there are lots of places, California one, where it's really hard to do that. It's been disrupted so long, uh, so badly, and the conditions, the potential for explosive fire is so omnipresent, just always latent out there, that it's very hard to, to reintroduce. So it's very much a mixed story. And then we have the other fire story, or what I absorb into a fire story, which is burning fossil fuels, which for me is not something strange. This is another inflection point in humanity's long, long quest for finding new things to burn and new ways to burn it, uh, where now we're, we're unhinging the climate and all of the knock-on effects that has. So for me, climate history, modern climate history has become a subset of fire history. So that provides a kind of master narrative. You know, I'm so climate. glad you mentioned that. Uh, so this will be a, 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 a perfect segue into the, the second part of our talk about the pyro scene. But before we get directly into that, because I know people are going, Sam, would you ask him the question that we all want to know? <laughs> And, and that is the big debate over climate change and what appears to be a from uh, from Greenland in Siberia uh, to California to Australia. Not I won't so much put uh, Brazil and Indonesia into this one, but the climate change, particularly the Arctic. California and Australia, how much at this point is climate change a driver of uh, out of control wildfires at this point? Yeah. And is that and is it going to be an increasingly bigger driver of, of wildfire as this whole climate picture unfolds. How, where do you come in on this whole yeah. debate? Well, all the areas you're you're pointing out, with the exception of Greenland, uh, which which hasn't had fire for a long time, essentially, except in very select North settlements uh, for for a while, uh, are all places that are naturally prone to fire. 
And so what you need is you have to have regular wet dry cycles. So it has to be wet enough to grow stuff and then dry enough to to burn it off. And places like California, uh, Australia with a Mediterranean climate or wet dry tropics, the Arctic, all these places have that and they have a very long history of of active burning and uh, frequently explosive burning, very large, high intensity burning. But what we're seeing with climate change, uh, it's acting as a kind of performance enhancer. It seems to be aggravating these. It seems to be making those events more frequent. Uh, and then they're interacting with how we live on the land, and which very often it has takes very little uh, account of what kind of fire is possible. I mean, California would burn. If people disappeared from California, it would burn, and it would burn hugely. From time to time, it would just burn to the Pacific. It's just built that way. But most of what we have done, including uh, climate change in more recent decades, is all pushing that uh, to higher forms. So it's not that we suddenly have fire breaking out where there had never been fire. These are This is aggravating the situation. How much, no one really knows. Maybe 40%, 50%, this might increase. But it also depends what responses we take apart from dealing with climate, how we site our houses, uh, how we manage our, our public lands, uh, what we do with all these other sorts of things. We're, we're not helpless here. And I, I also avoid, I tend to avoid the term driver. What's driving these? Because fire fire is a reaction. And I see it as a driverless car. It's barreling down the road. It's integrating everything around it. And at one point, this may be a, you know, a steep curve called climate change. And another place, it may be a really tricky intersection where town and country meet. There may be a lot of road hazards left over from bad land practices and logging slash. It can be lots of things. So at different places, at different times, things will loom particularly large. And I I think that's, I, I take that as a hopeful observation analogy, because it means there are also lots of points of intervention. It's not that there's one thing, and unless we solve this one thing, we're, we're helpless. We just, there's nothing to do but build concrete bunkers and wait it out for a few hundred years. Um, there are lots of things we can do. Again, fire fire is not like uh, hurricanes, which may be increasing in frequency and intensity due to climate change and um, ocean warming. They feed off that living landscape, and there are lots of ways to intervene. You just have to do it smart. And the other thing is that we so often fire is so graphic, it's so visceral, it's so guaranteed to draw attention. I mean, if there's a flame, you've got to look at it. We can't not yeah. look at it. That people use it to animate all kinds of other agendas. And so we have all kinds of discussions when we have these bad fires. And often none of those proposed solutions have anything to do with fire. They're just using the fire to divert attention and animate some other, some other project. And so it's very hard to sort of stay on focus. Is this really addressing the fire issue or are we using fire for something else? Well, you are a strong proponent in, in your writing. Just so make sure I, un, I do understand you and people don't misunderstand you. You are a strong proponent for getting fossil fuel burning out of the human uh, equation. Is that Correct. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, I think it's unrealistic to expect people to go back to the firepower analogy to, to renounce power. Uh, but we have to find substitutes for it. But that is that is uh, unhinging so much of the planet and our, our future habitability that we have to we have to do that. But then that still doesn't mean that fires are going to disappear. Um, we're still going to have to actively manage these landscapes. We're going to be putting, we're probably, this will sound paradoxical, but most places we're probably going to be putting a lot more fire back in the land than we have now. We're just going to be doing different kind of fire. Instead of having these sort of wild eruptions, we could have a kind of quasi-tamed um, burning, which would make much more sense and create some space for 
for some of the natural barns and remote areas to let them play out. We can, we can sort of act, we're not just going to let them go, but we can actively loose herd them. We, we can do things with it. So I would imagine a whole lot more burning in what I call living landscapes, but ultimately we have to shut down uh, sort of the lithic landscape burning, this binge burning, which is unhinging everything and reducing reducing the options available to us. Okay, so we are we are thirty six minutes into this, so uh, <coughs> let's let's move in into the 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 the, the what I want to talk about mostly, and this is the whole idea of the pyro scene. I'm just going to read just a, a, a quick little kind of a mashup of what you have written, and then I'm just going to let you take a, a, a rip on this. Uh, okay. Our history has been a story of how we and fire have co-evolved, which is what we've been talking about up until now. The same holds for our future. I coined the term pyro scene as a catchphrase in a 2015 essay titled Fire Age, I have long regarded all of the Holocene as an Anthropocene, which is kind of what we've been talking about. From a fire perspective, I now regard the Anthropocene as a Pyrocene. Basically, the concept of the Pyrocene says... We are in a fire age, which you capitalize, a fire age of comparable scale to the ice ages of the Pleistocene. Its core premise is that we made an alliance with fire that gave us small guts and big heads, as we've been speaking about, and then took us to the top of the food chain, where we now stand, and now threatens to unhinge the planet, whether that alliance is a mutual assistance pact or a Faustian bargain may be the question of our time. So, Stephen Pine, uh, just try to put uh, the, the pyro scene into 15 minutes. Sure. Well, I'm trying to find a way to, to sort of uh, help visualize um, what's coming at us and, and why. And like all of us, I'm concerned about that environmental future. And I've, I've listened to a lot of commentators argue that it's so dire and so strange what's coming at us that we have no narrative for it, no narrative to connect it to our past, and we have no analog we're facing a no-analog future. And I I disagree. I come at it as a fire historian, as a fire guy. I think we've got a great narrative. This is a continuous story of humanity putzing around with fire, uh, trying to find new things to burn, uh, using using fire to leverage uh, our, our position on the planet. Uh, now, it, we may have become the sorcerer's apprentice uh, with regard to fire. And I've also been struck that we, we may have an analogy available to us. The Pleistocene was subject to repeated ice ages, these great great ice sheets uh, icing over the Arctic and Antarctic oceans, uh, but lots of other effects, uh, pluvial lakes. It was cold and wet. Uh, lots of the Great Basin was, was just huge lakes, for example, immense lakes in Africa. We just have little vestiges left. Um, all kinds of outwash plains with uh, uh, sand uh, and loess. Uh, you start adding all this up, and and you know changes in sea level and extinctions. Uh, the fifth great extinction uh, that we know of in Earth history. And I was thinking that we are we are now creating a fire equivalent of that. Uh, it kind of begins mapping on it. The the number of areas that are now prone to fire. Fire doesn't sit there like an ice sheet would. It's it's a reaction, but it leaves its presence and returns. Uh, we've also got all kinds of um, places that, that are fire famined, uh, that, that are unmoored because they don't, disrupted because they're, they're not getting it. You start adding up all the biogeography at 
at regional and even continental scales. And the the shifting of fire looks pretty comparable to, to the ice. Um, and then we have changes in sea level. We have uh, mass extinctions going on. A lot of this is the result of the effect of one of the consequences of fire, which is climate change. But even apart from that, we're seeing we have lots of stuff going on. So uh, at that point, it becomes, it seems to me, the pyrocene becomes a useful device. Whether anybody else is going to take it up, I don't know. Uh, but it becomes a way of thinking about what this world uh, will look like, might look like, and what our relationship to it might be if we put fire at the center. And for me, fire, fire has always been at the center of our existence and how we interact with the planet. Uh, I mean, it's, you know, it's what we do that no other creature does. I mean, other animals knock over trees and dig holes in the ground. We do fire. Uh, so this, this is a way of, of using fire to create a narrative, using fire to create an analog, giving us another way of looking at it that isn't encumbered. A lot of people, I mean, I like the Anthropocene as a concept. I like the term. But people don't really know, what does that mean? And um, What does it mean to you? And how does well, the pyro just seem to, different? I think I think it simply means the the increasing dominance of of humans or over over Earth systems, and it doesn't necessarily mean that we're in control. It simply means that we are we have the power to disrupt on a scale which is somewhat unprecedented. Uh, and so I I like that, but they don't know what it means. And the whole climate change debate is so encrusted with with. Uh, other issues that it's very hard some ways to break through and begin talking about it. But fire provides a very clear way of talking about it. This is a continuous narrative. This is what it, this is what the future might look like. And the other reason I like it is because uh, even when we talk about these big fires, climate change is maybe 40 or 50 percent, who knows how much of of the difference. Again, this this kind of added leverage. But the rest of it is land use, how we live on the land, how we build our houses, how we organize our economy and landscapes. But what is underwriting that? What is underwriting that is also very largely fossil fuels. So from both sides, the climate change and the land use side, we have we have a common focus, uh, which is fossil fuels. So I think it becomes an added argument. It's actually a more powerful argument. Uh, for getting control of our of our binge burning. So so give us. I, I, I'm still a, a, a little unclear, Stephen. <laughs> what is your? Let's. I always like to. Uh, well, we're now. I'm so glad on one way we're we're into 2020. It just you know it just has such a nice ring, and it yeah. also makes it a lot easier for me to say 30 years from now. 2050. Mm -hmm. What is fire going to look like, uh, according to your crystal ball? What is our relationship with fire, our pact or our, our running in terror from it? What is it going to look like in the in 30 years from now in 2050? What is fire, the pyro scene, going to look like in the average life of uh, of somebody? who might be listening to this podcast? Well, uh, that's that's hard. Uh, I'm not trying to be evasive here, but I'm basically a historian, and I have enough trouble understanding yeah. the past. And I get this I, answer. Every, every single historian I have ever asked a similar question to, I get the same answer. But yeah. you, uh, but I know me, that you have uh, that, that that you have your own, and I'm not going <laughs> to hold you to that. I'm not going to come back uh, <laughs> when you're a hundred years old and I'm ninety uh, and, and say nanny nanny boo boo. Come on, give give us yeah. just some idea of your hazy, smoky vision of 2050 from the pyrocene perspective. Well, right now, uh, if we just sort of project the current. Uh, set of circumstances into the near future, we're going to see a lot more of the same. It's sort of persistence forecasting. Um, we're going to see a lot more wildfires, uh, places that have had 
fires, including large fires uh, and intense fires, are more likely to have larger and more frequent uh, fires. Um, other places um, which have not had fires may uh, may get them, and but they may get them in a form that they're really not adapted to. So we could see major turnovers in vegetation. Even places that have uh, a tradition of, of fire, crown fires, uh, combined with climate change, invasive species, other stuff, we may see um, them coming back to something else. There's no reason to think that they will continue, that fire will be conservative in that sense. It will be revolutionary. It will be birthing a, a new kind of order. Uh, we seem to see a spread of invasive grasses in particular, uh, cheatgrass, best known, but that's not the nastiest. Uh, there are lots of others out there, uh, all of which may be fav all of which will create uh, a world very different from the one to which our society uh, has been built around. So a lot of our infrastructure will, will no longer perhaps be suitable. Uh, even if we were to shut down fossil fuel combustion very quickly, say 10 or 20 years, uh, almost unimaginable we could move that fast. But if that happened, we're still looking at probably a couple hundred years at least for everything that we've put out there to work through the system. Uh, so I think fire may be a very convenient way uh, to organize how that how the world's going to look. Uh, I think it's going to mandate changes, but we're, we, we move pretty slowly. So I don't see us getting on top of this very quickly. So I would anticipate that a lot of the problems we've got, uh, you know, it's, it's what I said, well, bad fires, good fires, too much combustion, we're gonna have a lot more bad fires. Uh, we're probably going to struggle to get good fires back in, except in select spots. And until we control uh, our wholesale combustion of fossil fuels, um, the whole the whole planet will be in continual turmoil at probably rates that will exceed our ability to respond well. So that, I, that, I that, really that don't doesn't know. sound really <laughs> really optimistic. Where where are you on the optimism scale? Where, you know, it's about this point in the interview it, it, hitting fifty minutes that uh, that we we usually start getting the the optim the the Hollywood ending. Uh, <laughs> well, I don't see a Hollywood ending here, uh, but I I think you have to be a kind of uh, optimistic realist that if you if you assume that it's all gone to hell in a handbasket there's nothing you can do you'll do nothing and I'm not willing I'm not willing to accept that um, I've got children I've got I've got grandchildren you know if I can live to average life expectancy I may even have great-grandchildren and I don't want to just stand aside and say well there's nothing we can do uh, you kids uh, will all have to mop up uh, after us, uh, I think we have to decide that there. We have to get realistic. We have to be optimistic uh, to try to change it. We can't. We won't be able. Our acts won't be able to move the world the way we would like, but they will prevent it from going where it's going now. And any change in the right direction is worth taking because there, there are so many uncertainties out there now, I don't think anybody really knows. Um, but I'm, I'm not willing to just uh, despair um, because that, that does become a self-fulfilling prophecy and I'm not, I'm not willing to accept that. So what is, you know, this, this is always a, I, I, I guess this is an appropriate question in, in this discussion, I mean, what what can an average person uh, li listening to this do uh, in in their own in their own life? I, I mean, what what can I or anyone else listening to this do to actually a affect yeah. humanity's uh, relationship with fire? You know what I'm saying? I, I mean, this yeah. is such a what is your, do you have any personal advice to anyone listening? 
Well, I don't know. I mean, one one person against nine billion and counting, uh, <laughs> and the rest is not going to be able to make a huge change. But we all have different gifts, and we have to do what we can towards it. And mine, I think, is. Uh, my sense of fire and history, trying to communicate uh, the vision that I've that I've acquired over the years, and what this might mean as a kind of pragmatic warning. Trying to promote, there are small things you, we can do in our in our in our lives that would help to create markets. If enough individual people did, we could begin creating markets for other sources of power. We could begin changing, but ultimately. Uh, this is a political uh, challenge. And I think that behind that is certainly in this country, the, the sense of uh, our ability to function uh, politically. And that is, I don't mean by that, we, we make this the quote right choice because we'll all disagree about what that right choice is, but to have a process that we can all accept as legitimate so that we can begin discussing and moving. and. That I think is is I don't know how as an individual uh, you change that except in the small circles we operate on and in our own lives, but that seems to me the fundamental challenge. I don't think anybody has quote the solution uh, to this. Nobody will ever have the solution because it will always be changing. Uh, fire is a shapeshifter. It always has been. Uh, but we can begin creating the circumstances so that we can disagree, but we can at least make uh, the kinds of political choices at the scale that we need to begin moving towards that. One of my one of my favorite passages, actually fire passages, is from the Old Testament, the prophet Ezekiel, and he has at one point, they shall go out from one fire, and another fire shall consume them. <laughs> and I like that. I like because that too. I've never heard that one from good old Zeke. We're we're always going to be caught between two fires. There's no end point on yeah, this. Yeah. And so, uh, but we need to learn to manage it. You know, and up until a couple hundred years ago, humanity was doing more or less okay with fire. And then suddenly it all came unhinged. It, uh, I wonder what what happened to. to for for that to uh, to be kicked off. Well, Stephen Pine, I cannot believe we are already uh, closing in on the collapse of global industrial civilization on my camera battery. So, guys, uh, I do want to say that Stephen has an excellent website, uh, which I will put a link to on here where you can find a lot more just Stephen that's with a P-H S-T-E-P-H-E-N Pine P-Y-N-E StephenPine.com for a lot more and Stephen I want you to obviously hang around for a couple of minutes after we, we wrap this up but as I wrap up every one of my interviews here on Collapse Chronicles if you did not if you were not talking to Sam Mitchell at Collapse Chronicles, where you had one hour to uh, develop your thoughts, but you actually had the mainstream media sticking a, a microphone in your face in the waning days of 2019, asking, what is the 60-second soundbite to the mainstream media in the planet from Stephen Pine in the waning days of 2019, what would your 60-second soundbite to humanity sound like to wrap this up? Well, I, I would go back to some of the points I'd, I'd already made. I'd say that, you know, we are a uniquely fire creature on a uniquely fire planet. And fire has been indispensable to our rise. And we have rearranged fire in all sorts of ways. And it's time that we assumed responsibilities, uh, began appreciating uh, the extent, what that has meant, uh, and began um, reducing the amount of bad fires, promoting the number of good fires and extent of good fires, and then really get a handle, get really serious, get a handle on uh, shutting down our binge burning of fossil fuels. And at that point, we would create some space, some geographic space, some decision space uh, for us to begin uh, dealing with, with uh, lots of the other things. It is remarkable how many topics fire touches on. 
I mean, everything humanity touches is touched by fire. And that's a lot. It's not always the primary thing, but it's always there even as a catalyst. So I think that provides a way of thinking about how to how we created uh, these difficulties and some of the ways we might think about uh, unwinding that. Okay. And with that, again, stick around here, guys. I mean, stick around here, Stephen. <laughs> but, but guys, I am going to have to wrap this up. And if you did enjoy this interview with Stephen half as much as I did, please take a few seconds to uh, give a thumbs up to this video, or if you did not enjoy this video, you, I guess you could go over there and thumbs it down. Let's hope that doesn't happen. And by all means, if you want to uh, hear more of these interviews in the future, please subscribe to Collapse Chronicles. But right now, we're going to have to say, Stephen Pine, we really appreciate you coming on and spending an hour with us at Collapse Chronicles. But more importantly, we really do appreciate the hard work you have done over a long career educating the planet uh, about what we need to learn more about. And we thank you for that hard work. Well, thanks for the invitation. Always a pleasure to sit around a fire and talk, even if it's uh, digital. Okay, it has been. Bye, guys. <laughs>